Thanks, amen. Listen, last week uh, I preached a message called uh, A Body You Have Prepared for Me. I came out of the tent. I told y'all that it was part one. So today is A Body You Have Prepared for Me, part two. It's going to take me a little while to work towards my main thought, which will bring us to the, some of Paul's uh, letters. Amen. But, but in the meantime, we, we ended in Isaiah chapter six. And I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 6. And I just want to uh, read. Uh, uh, let's just say we're going to read Isaiah 6. I'm in the NASB version of the Bible. And we'll read chapter 6. And we'll go from 1 verses 1. Uh, well, let's just go ahead and let's just go ahead and, and, and read. Amen. Yes. Let's just go ahead yes. and read the chapter. That's a good thing. To do. Read the word yes. of God. All right. Here we go. In the year of King Uzziah's death. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined. The ESV version says, woe is me, for I am lost because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among the people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king. The Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. He said, go and tell this people, <coughs> keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and return and be healed. And then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth to tithe, a portion in it, and it will again subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to speak your word, oh Lord. I pray that you would use me as a voice, as a mouthpiece this morning, Lord. And I pray that I would be moved out of the way, Lord God, and that it truly would be you speaking this morning, Lord. I pray that you would speak through me the way you desire to speak, oh Lord God. You have many servants, Lord God, upon this earth. And Lord God, that you have called us and you have created us and you have molded us and fashioned us, Lord. And Lord God, while we might all be different, Lord, let us preach the same message, Lord God. Let our mouths not tell lies, but let our mouths tell the truth. And let your people, Lord God, be ministered to by your truth. And let the King of Kings be glorified by your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So we ended last week and we talked about the fact that Isaiah, he said that in the year King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord seated on the throne. Amen. And that, and the seraphim, which really means burning ones. And they cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And last week, really what I did was I went through the scriptures and I made the point to you that that God was preparing a body even from the beginning. And ultimately we realized that the body that was being prepared was Jesus. And the way that I described that to you was that even beginning in the garden, whenever the fall took place and the serpent slithered in and he brought deception into the heart of Eve. And then 
then through Eve, he spread it into Adam. And then we see, according to the scripture, we see that all of Adam's fallen race has been been blighted by this thing called a sinful nature. The Apostle Paul talks about the sinful nature that we receive from our father Adam. But the good news of the gospel is that you don't have to continue to be dominated by a sinful nature. The good news of the gospel teaches in the letter that Peter wrote that you and I can become partakers of the divine nature. Hallelujah. And that's what Jesus did for us at the cross. And that is what the resurrection proves. And all along through the ages of human history he was preparing a body for Jesus to come so like the lyrics saying look at this man upon this cross my sin upon his shoulders my sin upon his shoulders and, 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 and that's what he's come to do. He's come to prepare a body. I, you know, I don't, sometimes I have so many thoughts in my mind, I don't get them out. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about was even, I mentioned it about the flood, about how the whole earth was filled with so much sinfulness. And then after the flood, what's the first thing that Noah did? He took some of those clean animals. Remember, the Lord told him to put extra clean ones in there. And it was for a purpose because he built an altar to the Lord and he put those clean animals on that altar. And the scripture says that the, that the, burning of those animals was a sweet smelling savor in the nostrils of God. And we see the Levitical offering, offering after offering, 9 a.m., 3 p.m., annual Passovers, annual days of atonement, constantly animals with fat, even the frankincense on the, on the bread of presence that had to be changed out every Sabbath day and then poured upon the altar, sweet smelling fragrances in the nostrils of God. And then he says it in the book of Hebrews that we read it out of, that a body you have prepared for me because sacrifice and offering you have not desired. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, and I said, and maybe I was trying to be funny, but Peter would be so angry with God. And so many human beings are so angry with God because he does things the way that he is going to do things. And we're not going to form him and fashion him into our own image. He has told us who he is. He has told us his heart and he demands. He doesn't, de he doesn't just desire it, church. He demands that if we're going to serve him, that we're going to serve him yes. and live for him and worship him for the God that he is yes. and the God that he has revealed. Yes, is he long suffering and kind and merciful and full of love? He's proven that. Yes. He's proven it to each and every one of your hearts. Yes. Yes. At some point, tell me you wouldn't be in the house of God. And if he hasn't proven it to you, you to you yet, I dare you just let him in. Just get, just take a glimpse of his glory and just crack your heart open just a little bit and let him in. And see what he'll do for you. See what he'll do for you if you'll come to a place where you'll quit living for yourself and you'll let and you'll lay down your life for him like he laid down his life for you. Yes, yes. Even if it's just one minute at a time. Let the cross have its way in your heart. Let the cross have its sweet smelling. Well, you said, Lord, that that offering and sacrifice you don't desire. So why is it a sweet smelling sacrifice? I get people tell me that sometimes, and I'm not picking on anybody. So if you said it, and ain't, I'm not thinking about you. If you said it to me, there's been ten others that have said it to me. But like sometimes you say this, and sometimes you say that, you're contradictory. Well, why would the Lord say bring sacrifices, the sacrifice and offering you have not desired? Why in the book of Isaiah would 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 the Lord say, "Who told you to bring these vain oblations before me?" Well, Lord, you told me to bring the oblations and the sacrifices and the, and and all. Yes, yeah, but this is the thing. All of the why were they a sweet smelling fragrance in the nostrils of God? Because they were a constant reminder every day, every week, every year, every festival, and he had a plan, and the plan was to bring his son, and his plan was to prepare a body for his son, and it was all for you, because he loves you, that's the love of God, that, that you are a treasure in his eyes, and he made a way for you to be able to have relationship with him, and so it's a sweet smelling savior. In the nostrils of God. <laughs> because I remember that I have a plan. And it's a constant reminder. And so that's where we were. And at the end, we got to Isaiah. And we've kind of just finished with the seraphim crying, holy, holy. And now in verse 5, and I mean, I'm just going to kind of run through this. You don't really have to, but you can't put it up on the screen if you want. But I'm in the ESV right here, I believe. He said, woe is me, for I am lost. 
That's what the prophet Isaiah said. Because you see, whenever the heavens open, and in this vision, let me just talk to you real quick instead of just reading. In this vision, I want you to understand, do you know who he's seeing up here? Do y'all know who he's seeing? He's seeing Jesus. I'm not trying to give you a trick trick question. I'm telling you, you're seeing Jesus. And if you don't believe me, you need, need New Testament scripture. John chapter 12, verse 41. He, John, the, the beloved said, hey, when this is what Isaiah spoke of whenever he saw the vision of the Lord. See, Jesus was healing people and they still would not believe. And he said, well has the prophet Isaiah spoken unto you people that the word of the Lord would go forward and you would harden your hearts towards the word of God. People see signs and wonders and miracles and they still won't believe on the risen land. And, 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 and John the Beloved said, this is, what he, this is what they saw. They saw the Lord. Isaiah saw the Lord in his glory. He said, he said, whoa, it is me. I am undone. I am lost. Uh, I'm in the presence of a holy God. And I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live amongst the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You don't want to meet the Lord of hosts on the wrong day at the wrong time, friend. You want to be covered under the blood of Jesus when you meet the Lord of hosts. In the New Testament, he's called the Lord of Sabaoth. Not to be confused with the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord of the Sabbath is all about rest. The Lord of Sabaoth is all about war. He's a man of war. He's a, he's a judge. And listen, he's not here to judge his, his body. He's here to judge those that are outside of Christ. He's coming back to judge those that are outside of Christ. And it's only the blood. And it's so important that you understand that. It's only the blood. You coming under the blood. You recognizing that Jesus took your sin and, and your judgment upon him. And that you now are yielding to him and saying, yes, God, I'm like Isaiah. When I saw you, I realized how holy you were and how unworthy I was. But praise God. God, and then all of a sudden, one of the seraphim took a coal yeah. with tongs from off the altar. Now, I'm not here to do some deep teaching, but let me tell you, that's talking about the altar of sacrifice. For it was the coal of the altar of sacrifice that was the ignition for the incense on the inside of the temple. Don't bring strange fire into my house, Abihu and Nadab. <clears throat> No strange fire. It's a coal off the altar of sacrifice. It's a type of the sacrifice of Jesus. Even in the Old Testament, Isaiah doesn't know that this king's name is Jesus. He's seen this king after he was prophesied, after he came in, in, in the incarnation, after he died on the cross, after he was buried in the tomb, resurrected and ascended into glory with the Father. Isaiah sees the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he says, woe is me, I'm the God. Yes, yes. And when, that's the beauty of that song. Is that I don't know what you get from a song like that. But, 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 but like some of the words when it says, and in, in shame I hear my mocking voice. Do, do you think that? Do you think that I, I'm not walking around feeling condemnation and guilt because I've mocked the Lord? But I recognize that I'm part of the, I was part of the problem. Yeah. And I also recognize that as a believer, my actions have remained part of the problem at times. You know, one of the things that I've learned about this is this, is that when your heart is right with the Lord and you understand what Christ has done for you, Amen. And you're covered in his blood and you're walking in, in proper unity with the Holy Spirit, according to the Jesus of the Bible. It don't matter how hard a preacher preaches. Hallelujah. You're like, amen, brother. Amen. Preach it again, brother. Come on. Give it to me. But guess what? There's been times in my life whenever I wasn't walking right with the Lord, when my heart wasn't right. And you know, another thing I love about your ministry, sis, and, and again, I'm not overdoing it, but I want to say something. That I love that prophetic voice that's coming out of you. Yeah. Yes. She's prophesying on that guitar. Yeah. She, she, some of them words she was speaking was prophetic. You said something specifically about secrets. You know my secrets. Listen to me, church. He's the only one that really, really, really needs to know your secrets. 
And you bring those secrets before him and you lay them down at the foot of the cross and he knows everything yeah. about you. And if it, amen. And if you'll come into his presence and you'll let him deal with all those things, I'm telling you, he'll heal you. But yes. but he knows who we're not hiding them from. Amen. Yes. He said, he took that coal and touched it to to my lips. He touched my mouth. He said, your guilt is taken away and your sin has been atoned for. Amen. You know, the tone of Isaiah's voice is crying repentance. Yes. Uh, you won't hear the word sorry in the, in the transcript, <laughs> but, but his voice is crying yes. repentance. Yes. The kind, amen. And the Lord, he, he's overwhelmed with the glory and splendor of the Lord and he sees his own desperate condition and he wants to be right with God. And listen, then we're talking about the prophet of God. And I understand people say, yeah, but that's old covenant. He wasn't under the blood. Y'all just don't know the kind of, kind of, listen, I'm telling you, I've been doing this a long time. And people are always, whatever they find in the scripture, they're trying to make it fit there. And I'm not trying to fuss about it. I'm just saying, dude, I grow weary. The same God of the old covenant is the same God of the yes, new covenant. Yes. He's just being merciful and long-suffering and yeah. kind because, because the body that he prepared came and did what he asked him to do. And then he offered up his sacrifice. But there's coming a day. He says, even in, in the letter to the Romans, he says some people are storing up wrath for themselves. Yes. There, he said it. I was reading it this morning. And I'm not getting into this now. But he said, there will be many on that day that will come unto me and they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? And I get it. Some people are like, but, they, but he said he never knew them, so they were never truly saved. But let me say this, brothers and sisters, they sure enough thought they knew yes. him. Yes. They knew, they thought they knew him. Yes. And I don't know if that's sobering to you or not, but it's sobering to me as a preacher. And I'm just trying to say that Isaiah, the prophet of God, that spoke to us and told us that God is going to be with us and that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The same prophet that spoke in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53 and said that he took our transgressions and that he was beaten to the point that you couldn't even recognize him as a man. This same prophet, he says, woe is me. Because when you get into the splendor and the glory of God, it changes everything. And it's okay for that to happen because it's supposed to happen. That's right. That we're supposed to realize, oh God, but for your goodness, before your for your grace, for your, for your mercy that you poured out on your son for me. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness. Huh? Do you, you feel that? Thank you for your goodness, Father. Yeah, people people been in and out of the church like, man, you, like, I feel like you're yelling at me. I feel like you're like, I feel like you're, I feel like you're constantly, no, but you don't understand. I'm so thankful. <coughs> So thankful for what he's done that he had let me see myself. Amen. So that I could come undone at his feet. That I could lay it down at his feet. Yes. And that he would heal me. Amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, you and I need to get a glimpse of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I want you to know that heaven is not confused this morning. I said that last week. I'm going to say it again. The angels sing of his glory. They, the, the seraphim cried, holy, holy, holy. Holy are you, O Lord. They see it. The Bible says in the New Testament that the angels inquire about this thing called salvation. The idea in the Greek is that they're looking over the precipice of heaven. And they're viewing this. And they're like, what? You? Because you know what they know? They know that he didn't do that for their fallen brothers. Huh? Yes. And they're like, what is this? What is this going down here on this earth, this goodness that he pours out upon these earthlings? Wow, look, another one. Hallelujah! Another one gave their heart to the yes. king. And we cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Another sinner got saved. You might not get excited about it, church, but the angels of heaven are getting really excited every time a sinner gets saved and gives their heart to Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. He's worthy. Glory and honor. Look at Revelation 19.10. I don't know exactly what version I have here, but we'll, we'll get the point. 
It says, then I fell down. He's talking about John the Beloved in Revelation 19.10. I fell down at his feet to worship him. Talking about the angel. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Hallelujah. The testimony of Jesus. This is the sweet smelling savor that has been written upon the pages of human history. This is the sweet smelling savor of God. It's the testimony of Jesus. The old covenant. The new covenant. And every page that, that's in between it's all the testimony of Jesus. Right. He's, he deserves his glory and yes. his honor. You know the word repentance because I'm talking about Isaiah because it is part of my message. Because I want you to know, let me let the, let me go ahead and give you the, the punchline. Because you know me, I use a lot of words, but let me give you the punchline. The punchline this morning is this a body you have prepared for me, O Lord. <laughs> because see, now that you're in Christ, a body that He has prepared for you, O church. A body He has prepared for you, Brother Vince, Brother Jack. <laughs> Brother Jacob, a body, Sabrina, a body he has prepared for you. Because he's got a purpose for you. He's got a purpose for your life. Amen. And, and it starts with repentance. It starts with recognizing that I'm talking about you may have already repented. And I'm not going to get into as we continue to walk and we fall short of the glory of God. They got, they got certain preachers out there that are selling a lot of copies of books. And I'm not scared to call out a person's name, but I'm getting to the point where I don't really want to focus on that kind of stuff anymore. I want to focus on Jesus. Let's use his name a lot. Yes. But they got p people that are selling millions and millions of books. They're like, why do you keep repenting? You're so sin conscious. Now, I'm conscious of the fact that my sin had to be placed on my Savior. And I'm conscious of the fact that it was a high price that had to be paid. Amen. And I'm conscious of the fact, because I read the word of God, that, so, that I fall short of the glory of God. And I'm conscious of the fact that John said, we write these things to you that no man may sin. But if a man does sin, then there's an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm under the impression that I am supposed to bring this before the Lord when I'm walking outside of covenant with him. It's not going to just be okay, my friend, if we're living a life of perpetual, continuous sin. His body he has prepared for you. And if you'll trust him in his word, he'll develop that body and make it look the way he wants it to look. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen. Repentance, a simple definition, is someone who changes their mind. We repent towards God. We admit to him that we were wrong and he was right. We thought we knew, but now we see. Help me, Lord, I'm undone. I'm lost without you. I thought I was right. <laughs> Y'all got out here, man. I thought I was right in my opinion about this thing. Whatever this thing is. I, I mean, we don't have time to list all the things. Right? I thought I was right. Eve thought she was going to be right. Even though the Word of God says something else. It looked good. It looked like it was good for food. It looked like it was going to bring her pleasure. Deception, just twist a little bit here and play a little word, the letter game. Puzzle it up, make a different word. And, 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 but the deception turned, in, turned into a great travesty. Yes, yes, yes. I thought I was right. Now I see according to your word I was wrong. Now I'm coming to do business with you. Oh. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I'm coming to do business with you. Praise God. You don't have to do business with the preacher. You just need a preacher that tell you you need to do business with Jesus. Yes, amen. 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 And if you'll do business with Jesus, hallelujah. Yes. The, the word of God, Peter said in, the, in his message in the book of Acts, refreshing comes with repentance. Yes. The word, the asphyxiation, is the Greek word is built upon that. A means without. It means without breath. But guess what? The word comes from that word, but without the A. Hallelujah. It's like, because guess what? He's putting breath back in you. <laughs> He's putting the breath of the Holy Ghost back in you. He's bringing refreshing back in you. Hallelujah. And the guilt and the weight and the burden and the of condemnation is being lifted off of you. Hallelujah. I was wrong. You were right. And I love that word confession in the Greek New Testament too, because it's Homologia. It's a compound word. Homo, 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 we say the word homo. It means same. Logia means same. You know what it means? It means to say the same thing. 
say the same thing as what? Say the same thing as God in his yes, word. Yes. I say the same thing as you, Lord. I thought I was right. Now I realize I'm wrong. Now I say what you say. Yes. What I was doing was wrong. And I come to you, oh Lord, because I want to do what's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. But I want you to know, according to Psalm 7, verses 12 through 17. I'm about to get nicer in my message, I believe. I think. We don't know. We're going to let the Lord speak. Anyway, thank you, sister. Hallelujah. <laughs> Look what the Lord says in Psalm chapter 7, verse 12. Look at that. But that's Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's right. If a man does not repent, God will wet his soul. He's not talking about putting water on it. He's talking about a wet stone. Did you see the judge of the of the earth standing there in front of his armor? We don't like to see him that way, but if you read the whole of Scripture, I'm here to tell you he's going to have a sword protruding out of his mouth and he's going to slay the nations and that there are people that sat in churches that thought that they were okay. And listen to me, it may be, and if you are okay, then you know you're okay because like Sister Tick used to say, I know that I know yes. that I know. Yes. Hallelujah. I know because I know like the sister prophesied that I hadn't brought to the feet of my king. Amen. But for those, and listen, you're either in or you're out. That's right. Okay, you're either in or you're out, my friend. Justification by faith. Amen? You're either in or you're out. Let's be clear on that. Justification by faith. Is just, whenever you are truly justified, it is His righteousness and it is His blood that cleanses you. Your righteousness is not getting you in. My righteousness is not getting us getting me in. But let me just be clear on this. Sometimes we can rest so much in justification that we're acting like it's not a big deal. That it's not that what's happened on the inside is not being manifest on the outside. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? But you either in or you're out. Amen? Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Isn't that good that it's not dependent on you and your behavior to get you in? Praise God. I don't know about you, but that releases me from a bondage and a burden. Because if it was up to me, oh Lord. Okay. If a man does not repent, he will wet his sword. He's getting it ready. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out. Have you ever dug a pit for yourself? <laughs> like, I'm the, what are you talking about, preacher? I don't get it. Like, you made a plan. Yeah. You made a plan outside the will of God. And basically, you're like digging a pit. You don't even realize it, but you're digging, you're digging a pit. You're making a hole for yourself. Yes. And then it, then it goes on to say this. It says, he makes a pit, he digs it, and he falls into the hole. <laughs> the very plan that you're, that you're making, the, the scheming, yes. planning, okay? The very plan that you're, that you're making, that, that, that you would fall into it, and that your own mischief will return on your own head. Lord, help us. Yes. Amen. Help us. Yes. We forget these kinds of passages. There have been times as a pastor I have forgotten these things. You don't want to hear that? I'm, just, I'm here to tell you the truth. There have been times as a believer and a pastor that I've gotten so focused on justification by faith that I wasn't paying attention to my own life. And I'm over here thinking, oh, no, everything's good. It's the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It is the blood of Jesus. But we better recognize and have fear and reverence and awe for the holiness of God. Amen. Amen? Yes, yes. But look at verse 17. See, this is y'all. This is you guys right here. You ready? Because that's why you're in the house of the Lord this morning. But I will give, give to the Lord the thanks that is due his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord. The most high. So after the call touched Isaiah's lips and the, something happened on the inside of him, then all of a sudden the Lord's like, who shall we send? And what does Isaiah say? Send me, Lord. See, when something happens to you on the inside of your heart, 
and you begin to yield to the will of God for your life, you start dying and he starts living. Amen. And see, you you are, I'm sorry, you are called to be a preacher. You may not be called to be a preacher behind this pulpit, but I'm going to tell you right now, you're called to be a proclaimer of God's truth. Amen. He's given you a mouth to proclaim and to declare the goodness and the righteousness of God in the midst of an untoward generation. Yes, yes. That word is scolios in the Greek, and it's where we get the word scoliosis, and it means a crooked and untoward generation. This, this generation got scoliosis, man. Yes, the back yes. is bent and it can't walk right. And he's called people like you and people like me to die to self. We're going to get into that. So that Christ can live through us. Amen. So that we can give glory and honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And for some of you, are like, well, I don't feel like I can do it. Well, first of all, we need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Although I will say this, I've seen some Baptist preachers. And some Baptist people out witness a Pentecostal. Yeah. <laughs> that been, yeah. Okay, but anyway, that's not good. I'm not trying to cause no trouble with you. I walked in one time at the clinic because I'm a nurse practitioner too. I've been seeing kids for a long time. I walked into the clinic many, many years ago. I'm like, dude, what kind of book you reading over there? Like, that's thinking I'm going to stir this dude up, right? He said, I'm reading the Holy Word of God, bro. Like, and he's like coming right back at me. He's like, I'm, I'm about to tell somebody. To, and I'm like, well, what church you go to? Well, he was a pastor, but he said, I'm a Baptist pastor, bro. And I mean, dude, that dude was more on fire for the Lord. I sat down and said, okay, speak to me, bro. <laughs> Lower yourself a little bit, man. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Whom shall we send? Who's going to go for us? He said, here I am. Send me. Okay, Lord, I'm ready. Now, now give me the message. What shall I speak? Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, blind their eyes. And then I said this. That, that, that said, sound like a good ministry. <laughs> Now, I know it's Old Testament, and in reality, he's saying, keep telling my children, Israel, the truth of my word, and they're going to reject you because they have rebellious hearts, and because my people are stiff-necked and rebellious people. This is not what the word of God says. Right. But you think that there's not people in the church like that? I'm not trying to say it's in this church. I'm not trying to say it's you. It's your, for you to determine whether or not you're stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Right. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. Come on, don't receive something that doesn't belong to you, but don't let me not preach what's in his word. Yes. Because, see, it'd be different if everybody after the new covenant started acting right and doing right. But that's not reality. And even people that have given their heart to the Lord and sit in churches are not doing right. Amen. Right? Amen. Help us, Lord, and each of us falls short of the glory of God. Amen. But praise God. We, don't, we, we, we repent. We get our heart right. We get back up. Praise God. And he's, and he's changing us. Amen. Amen. We're going to work with him. We're going to work with the Holy Spirit. We're going to let him change us. Amen? Amen. So he said, how long am I going to do this? Until the cities, verse 11, lie waste without inhabitants. And houses without people. And the land is desolate, a desolate waste. And look at this in verse 13. And though a tenth remain in it. I think this is the ESV. Though a tenth, that's a tithe, my friend. A remnant. Though a, though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains. Then it is fell. Look at this. The holy seed is its stump. Well, this is some deep theology right here. Not, I'm not trying to get too deep on you, but look, the same prophet said this. And a branch will shoot forth from the stump of Jesse. <laughs> same prophet, same book. And a branch will shoot forth from the stump of Jesse. Who's Jesse? David's father. Who's David? King David. Who? Where did Jesus come from? The tribe of Judah. The, 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 the lineage of David. Uh, a, a branch will come forth. Jesus says that I'm the vine and you're the branch. He wants to turn you and I into a branch that's connected to him. That is the remnant that's going to be left. And hallelujah, he left the remnant for Israel. And through Israel, he gave the world Jesus because he was Preparing a body, and the body he was preparing was Jesus. But guess what? He's also preparing you. Those that would believe in him. It's not time to monkey around, my friend. It's not time to play games. The days are growing darker by the minute. You know that. 
I know that. Some of you are probably watching the news quite a bit. Some of you saw that debacle the other day. I'm just thinking to myself, this is a fictional movie I'm watching. Yeah. Yeah. This is not reality. That's right. And it's really not. I don't believe, now I'm not going to get into all that. I'm not going to get into all that. But I'm just saying, dude, what is happening? The Lord's brewing a message about the watchman. It's, it's brewing in my heart. I'm just like, Lord, I just want to make sure. I just want to make sure I got it right. Lord. Something's brewing in the land, my friend. That's right. Now's the time to get our heart right. That's right. This is not a fictional show. This is not some of the book that we read. This thing is happening. Listen, my, I thank God for it. <laughs> I'm not going to go on and on again, but I got the two women in this house right here that are responsible for my salvation. Amen. I wanna, but I want to tell you something, Sister Cassie, back there, let my sister Debbie to the Lord. And Debbie, I'll never forget. And, and I don't want to go on and on about it too much, but I'll never forget the day she came to our house. I was about 13 years old. And dude, I, tell, I tell the story all the time. I was like, dude, she was slinging Jesus like nothing I've ever seen. I was so uncomfortable. I went to bed that night. I said some weird stuff that night. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I don't want to get into it too deep. But I was like, Lord, she, I don't even know if she loves you. I ain't never heard. What is that love? But I paid the price for it. I'm not going to get into that. But look, but look, she bring me back and forth to church when I was a little kid. And when the time was right, hallelujah, yes. when the yes. time was right, I'll never forget, you can do what you want with street preachers and people that hand out tracts, but that's why I do it. People think, you, if, if you don't understand why I do it, let me tell you why I do it. I was walking in the, at the strip in Lafayette, I was leaving the bar called The K, and I was walking across the street to Mako's, and that whole church over there in Burke was praying for me. They were praying for my soul because back in the day, people of God prayed for people. Back in the day, people interceded for the souls of people. And I was walking across the street and there was college kids right there with these tracks in their hands. And I had two friends in front of me and they were like, here, man, this is the love of Jesus. I don't want that. Get that out of my face. And the next guy said the same thing. And I said, I couldn't do it. I said, give it to me. I want it. And I stuck it in my pocket. And the next morning, I woke up and I felt it. And I read it, and it said, all this I did for thee, and his blood was streaming down his face. And I just began to weep. And on the foot of my bed, I wept, and I wept. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give it all to him right there. But it was such a, that, such a powerful moment in my heart. I'll never, I'll never forget it, because it's real, and he, he changed me. And the reason that I said that is, that's how the word of God is spread. That's how the word yes, of God yes. goes forth. It's when somebody has a has a, just a sit down in their house and they tell them, oh, by the way, did I tell you, uh, I'm not that religion anymore. <laughs> oh, you can't. Got to be politically correct, right? I'm not that religion anymore. Uh, and now I've gotten bored again. Let me tell you a story about a man named Nicodemus. <laughs> yes. All right. And that's how it happens. And then that one tells that one. That's John chapter 1. Two disciples disconnected from John the Baptist. They connected to Jesus. And there Andrew goes and finds his brother Peter. And then they find Philip in Galilee. And then they find Nathaniel under the fig tree. Hallelujah. That's how this gospel message starts. Amen. Amen. Something happens on the inside of you. And then you got to tell somebody about it. Amen. Amen. But if we're living for ourselves, we're not. I don't. There's a stump, a holy seed. That stump remains and that branch shoots forth, amen, and it's going to produce life. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Two times Lord of Hosts, and this is not my message, but I said it earlier, Lord of Sabaoth, he's the commander of the Lord's army. He's a general of angels, my friend. That's the God you serve. You serve a God that is a general of angels. You want to talk about a war? I'm, I'm shooting from the hip, but I'm pretty sure that one angel wiped out 185,000 of that king's army. One angel! Yes. And this is what Isaiah saw. After all of that, he saw the ascended King of kings and Lord of lords, the eternal word who created the heavens and the earth, 
who willingly lowered himself and was fashioned into a man so that he could serve the Father's will and die. That's Philippians right there. And not just any death, but the death of the cross. Yes, yes. He suffered torture and shame. He was offended for our sakes because we had offended God. But, but this, and yet, oh, the goodness of God, Isaiah 53, verse 10. Because if you want to know how much God loves you, this is what it says in Isaiah 53, 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. <laughs> what? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Father to bruise his son because that's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves the human race. It, it, I don't understand it. I, I don't remember the lyric to the song, but it says something like this. I can't, I can't understand it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all sang the song like I can't, I can't remember what it said, but it's like I, I, don't, I don't understand. I can't explain it, but I know that it happened. Why would you do this? The, the psalmist David said the same thing. He said, well, what is man that you're mindful of him? Thank you, Jesus. And that's how it starts, my friend. It starts with somebody telling somebody the good news of Jesus. Amen. And then a seed is planted inside of their heart. Now, Isaiah said, send me and... And, and Paul said in the book of Romans, how beautiful are the feet of those that are sent. And how can they call upon him of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? How beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel. Yes. And a preacher, again, I'm going to say it, it's not just somebody that stands behind a pulpit. Right. The word itself means to be a herald or a proclaimer. You walked into the wrong church. If, you, if you're going to get squirmy on me because I'm telling you that part, that a big part of your life is to tell other people about the goodness of God and what he's done in your life, you walked into the wrong house this morning. I'm here to tell you that you, listen, the word of God says that you were put on this earth for a purpose and it wasn't to have bigger cars and bigger houses and bigger yes. bank accounts. Yeah. The Lord may very well give you bigger cars, bigger houses, and big bank accounts because he's a God that paves the streets in gold. He's got a cattle on a thousand hills. But I'm here to tell you right now, let us not be deceived, church. And I myself have been overran by covetousness before as a man of God. And I'm here to tell you right now, covetousness will still try to steal the glory of God out of your heart and out of your life. Don't let it get a hold of you, my friend. Make sure you keep Jesus as the principal thing in your heart and in your life. Praise God, that is your purpose on this earth, to let Jesus be formed in you, amen, and for you to release him in the midst of this darkened world. Yes, yes. This is a test. You hear me? Adam was tested, you're tested, I'm tested. And Leonard Ravenhill said that this life is a nothing, this is a dress rehearsal for eternity. And in one of my messages, the Lord said, well, it's even more than that, my friend, it's a job interview. <laughs> yeah. Parable of the talents. It's a job interview. A man, a man went on a long journey and he gave one of his servants five and one of his servants three and he gave another one one. And he's coming back to settle accounts. He's coming back again. It might seem sci-fi to you. It might seem like it's not. I'm here to tell you the word of God says that I believe it. It is true. He's coming back again to settle accounts. Amen. And he said, what did you do with what, 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 what I gave you? I got you ten, master. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And it's not because you got him 10 that you're a good and faithful servant. It's because I got to take the whole of scripture. And it's because he gave you something. You were a faithful steward of it. And if you actually did that, then you allowed yourself to die so that Christ could live through you. And now you accomplished the will of the Father. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in small things. Now enter into your arrest and be a ruler over many things. Hallelujah. <laughs> did you get what I just said? Yes. You're in a temporary state of mind. You're in a job interview. You're in a dress rehearsal. And one day, temporary is going to let get, going to let go. And eternity, listen to me, eternity. I don't think I can say that enough. There's coming a day when there is no. And I'm not here to preach about the kingdom parables right now. I'm not. I got to get moving. But I can't get it out of my heart and out of my mind that there's coming a day when we're going to face Him. And praise God, we're covered in the blood. We're good. Amen. We're entering in. Hallelujah. Enter into your rest. Ha Hallelujah, Lord. I made it. You did it for me. Thank you, Jesus. There's still a 
judgment seat of Christ. And some people's works are going to be a Haywood and stuff. Yes. I wouldn't be a good preacher if I didn't tell you that. That's right. You think that's just for me? No, it's for all of these people. Amen. If you call, you to call your friend that doesn't give their heart to the Lord till the last day before they give in, to call your friend every week to have coffee with them and you were faithful to it and you gave them Jesus and, and you gave them the truth of the gospel every day. Hallelujah. And even if they didn't give their heart to Jesus and you were faithful to what the Lord called you, that's what your reward will be based on. That's right. That's right. How beautiful are the feet of those that tell the gospel. Amen. And that's where it starts. A seed is planted. Amen. A seed is planted. And, and the Holy Spirit, he waters that seed. He takes care of that seed. I think of my own life. I know I've been talking to John a lot. I know he's been thinking about his own life a lot lately. Right? I've talked to so many. And I, know, and I don't know if you ever do that. If you think about the journey that, that you went through to get you to the place where you are here. And I know that people get tired of hearing my story. I know Lexiera was like, she wasn't be, making fun of me, but she was like that. And you, your little story so cute. She didn't say it exactly like that. But it's not like, you know, like your little story so cute. Daddy. And she even told me that she had a conversation with you. And she's like, I know what daddy's story. He don't really, he don't really get it like we do. But but he got a cute little story. You know, he's sitting on that air conditioner outside that triple quick on Josh's street, waiting for somebody to come get him high when he was 18. His story. So now I think about that. I'm like, wait, what? Wait, what? I was a 17. My daddy used to drive down that street. Why you keep talking about? I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about Jesus. My daddy drive down the street and he go back to Elmwood. I think it was 102 Elmwood. He said, I'll be late. I'm worried about that boy. Daddy, I'm worried about that boy. He's just sitting on that air conditioner. Like, what is he doing? <laughs> and then God showed up. Yes. <laughs> he showed up when I didn't deserve him. Yes. And every time I try to walk away. Or every time I've tried to walk away or said I quit, I give up. He's like, it's not time. It's about time you give up. <laughs> and, and I wish you would. And I wish you'd let me have my way with you. But when that seed gets planted, it's when it all starts. See what I'm, what I'm trying to talk about? I'm talking about? What I'm trying to say is the cultivation of a seed. The cultivation of that seed, which is Christ, that has been planted yes, in your yes. heart. It is so precious. Yes. So precious. Some falls along the wayside in the foul of the air, gobble it up. Some falls among stones. You better get the stones out of your field, my friend. Whatever it is that's going to obstruct the flow of the roots going down to the ground, that you might become the planting of the Lord, Isaiah 61. You better remove those stones. Some fell amongst the thorns. Care for the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and wrap around, strangulate the seed, which is the plant, which is Christ that is in your heart, because he is the seed of the kingdom. Right. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. And that seed is being prepared. Listen, the whole Bible is about seed, time, and harvest. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 talks about, you don't have to try to keep up with this. I know you're faster than me, but look, Genesis 1, 11, he created everything with a seed within itself to reproduce after its own kind. Yes. Within Adam and Eve was the seed to reproduce after its own kind. And at that moment in time, it was perfect. It was holy. It was pure. And it would have been reproducing in the image and likeness of God. And all of his holiness. Genesis 8.22. It says as long as there is there are seasons. There will be seed time and harvest. Leviticus 23 talks about all the feasts of the Lord. That represent Jesus. And every one of them was a harvest feast. Ruth. The, the story of a Gentile bride being married to her kinsman redeemer. Takes place in the middle of the barley harvest. The whole story is about a harvest, a parable of a sower and a seed and whether it's going to live and whether it's going to grow or whether it's going to be snuffed out. And the wheat in the storehouse and the winnowing fan. He's got a winnowing fan in his hand and the chap is going to be burned in unquenchable fire. But the wheat, the wheat of God, the grain of God will be put into the storehouse. You're the grain of God this morning if you've received the seed. Yes. You just got to let it grow. Hallelujah. And you got to understand this world is hostile to the seed. Yes, yes. The world 
world system is hostile to the seed of God that has been planted in your heart. It's a treasure. Oh, Jesus. And that is the beginning. And now we see the purposes of God in preparing a body for the Lord. And he said this. He said, truly, truly, unless a grain of wheat, Jesus said this, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it will die, what will it do? It will bear much fruit. And John chapter 1 says this, to those that believed on his name, he gave them power to become the what? The sons, the daughters, the children of God. <laughs> if you got the seed of God in your heart this morning, if you said yes to Jesus and you meant business with Jesus, if you responded to the call, I'm here to tell you something. The devil's trying to lie to you and tell you you messed up too bad. You wasted the, all the years, the caterpillar, the worm, the, the locust, the palmer worm, the, all these worms that ate it up. No, he's a liar. The God that I serve is a God of restoration and reconciliation. He can turn Turn it around. He can make the ladder better than the form. Right. Yeah. That's the God I serve. Yeah. He's a God of resurrection. He makes dead things live. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's the word of the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you for life, Lord. Yeah. And it all starts with a preacher. Praise God. A preacher with some seed in his mouth. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm not trying to get weird, but one time I was going to preach a little message, and I found one. You got these new... Uh, Farm implementing tools that so that pour out seed. I got a video. It's in my my iPad, but I never did use it. Where they just shoot seed, like they just put it on a tractor and they're riding like on the they're shooting grass seed like on the side of a encampment on the side of a highway. Like you get this big old stream of seed, and like just flowing it like a hundred yards and just planting a whole field. I was thinking about that, man. I was like. I used to preach a man. I was like, I want to be like Johnny Appleseed. I thought about coming in here like that. But it like a NATO belt with some glitter in it and throwing it. Hey! And then the girl that man cleans the church, she'd be mad at me. Uh, so I want to be like Johnny Appleseed. I want to sow some Jesus seed out here. Oh, let it take hold, Lord. Let it give us some money. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. We're talking about Jesus still. We're about to shift gears in a second. Who being the brightness of his glory. The brightness of whose glory? The Father. Because we're talking about Jesus. Who being the brightness of his glory. He is the express image of his person. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins. Sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Normally, when I read that passage, I focus on the fact that he sat down. Because I always want the people to know that his work is a finished work. All, the he book of Hebrews says that those priests never sat down. You know why? Because their work was never complete. Because the blood of bulls and goats can't remove sin. That's right. Jesus stood up one time, though, right? Y'all remember what he stood yes, up for? Yes. Uh, Stephen. Stephen. Stephen the martyr. Hallelujah. Jesus is standing up. Hold on, boy, just a little bit longer. I don't know what your eschatology is. I don't want to get into that right now. But no matter what you face, I just want to tell you this. Hold on just a little bit longer, my friend. Hold on just a little bit longer. Because the angels are about to welcome you into glory, Stephen. Oh, hallelujah. But he sat down. But, but what stuck out to me here was the lyric that was in that song. By himself, he purged our sins. All by himself. And I thought about that moment on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. <laughs> my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father had to turn his face from Jesus. Yes. Not because of Jesus' sin, because he had no sin. It was because of my sin that was placed upon his shoulders. I don't have to talk to you right now. I don't have to put it on you. You don't have. He did because of me. Because of my sin. But he, but he did that because he loved me. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame 
What is the joy? The joy to know that you can be eternal son and daughter of God. The joy to know that you can live with him for an eternity as his children in an eternal kingdom. I think, listen, I, the, the modern church has done a travesty to the plan of God. A travesty. And if I'm wrong for saying the Lord forgive me, but I'm going to tell you one thing right now. I have gotten a pure, fresh revelation that I will give an account for every word spoken behind this sacred desk. And all I can say is, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for times that I didn't know it and I might have promoted myself more than I promoted Jesus. Forgive me for times that I might have said something in a way to maybe purposely. I don't know what I'm thinking sometimes. Hurt someone. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to help people. I need you to know that God sent forth his son to save you. And it's so serious. Yeah. It's such a serious thing. And we're here and we've, we've, we've been the harlot. Uh, none of this is in my notes. The harlot is right in the back of that seven-headed beast and she throws back her head and she's got blood dripping down because she's drunk with the saints, the blood of the martyrs. And the whole and all the inhabitants of the earth are drunk with her intoxication. Yeah. She has committed adultery with the rulers of the earth and the whole inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with her lies. Yes. It's time to sober up, church. Yeah, right. This ain't no game we're playing. That's right. Amen. Serious business. Lord, help us. By himself, he purged our sins. God prepared a body for the last Adam so that Adam's fallen race could become recipients of the Father's grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But now look at Colossians 3.10. Now we're getting into where we wanted to go. <laughs> Paul says this, but you have put on the new man. Colossians 3.10. King James Version, sorry. Colossians 3.10. And you, and you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created you. See, man, Adam in the garden was created in the image and likeness of God. And listen, I didn't get into it. It was in there, but in Genesis 5.3, don't switch to that. It says that after 120 years, Adam had another son. His name was Seth. And Seth was born in the image and likeness of his father, Adam. And whether we realize it or not, we're all part of Adam's fallen race. That's right. But good news, good news. Jesus had a meeting with a religious leader named Nicodemus one night. And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto yes. you, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. He will not enter into the kingdom of God. So I got some bad news, but I got some good news. You'll either be born, born twice and only die once, or you'll die, or you'll be born once and die twice. I'll give credit to old Pastor Brad Holy for that. I said you'll either be born once and die twice. What does that mean? You'll die a physical death and you'll die another death at the great white throne judgment. Or you will be born twice, born of your mother in water and born again in Christ. And you will only die once, my friend. And he will welcome you with those nails carved hands. Yes, yes. Consider your situation. Yes. Consider whether you have been born again. Consider whether or not you watching on video, consider what you have done with the eternal Lamb of God. Now look at this in Romans 8 and 29. It says this, <clears throat> King James still, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I want, I want you to see that, to be conformed. It means to be fashioned like unto I can't help myself but to imagine an illustration of a potter with a wheel. And I always remember whenever he told the prophet Jeremiah, go to the potter's house and go look at that marked clay, son. Because he said that was Israel. But listen, mankind born in Adam is like marked clay. And sometimes in you and I, uh, we're on the potter's wheel, right? No, we are. We're on the potter's wheel. He's forming and he's fashioning us. And sometimes we make choices that put us outside the will of God, and it's almost like for a second he might lift his hands off. This is just all fresh right here coming out of my heart. He might, he might, we might feel like he's lifting his hands off of it a little bit because we're not in his will. And then what'll happen is, you ever seen that before? What'll happen is that that clay will start kind of like just detangling. And then when the time is right, what does he do? Yes. He comes and he calls you. Yes. He's like, all right, let's start again. Put a little water on it. 
Get the wheel rolling, those loving hands, amen. Molding, fashioning, forming. He's fashioning you into the image of his son. Yes. Don't, listen, if you're in Christ this morning, if you're a true believer, he's not going to leave you the way that you were. Amen. That's right. Amen. Wouldn't it be good if we just all said, okay, Lord, I get it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> here, here we go. Have your way. Have your way with me, Lord. Right? Wouldn't it be better if it had been better than five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? But praise God, it's never too late. All right, let's look at let's take a look at a couple other verses. Look at let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll look at verses 17 through 18. King James Version, we'll start with 17. But listen, I want to give you a little bit of <coughs> background on this passage because the whole chapter, Paul says, Do I need a letter of commendation? And he talks about the fact that you are our epistles written on your heart, right? And he says this, he's talking about the old covenant. He says that the old, the ministration of the old covenant, that there was glory connected to that. He said it was a covenant of death because no man could keep the law and it resulted in death, right? He said, but there's a new covenant. And if the first one had glory, just imagine the glory of the second. And it said that Moses, whenever he would go into the presence of the Lord, right, he would go in there without that covering on his face and he'd be face to face with the image of God and that the glory of God would shine over his face. And Paul said he put a veil over his face to explain, he said, listen, that covenant was fading away. But, the, the, but now there's a new covenant. And there's a glory in that new covenant. And I want you to see what it says in verse 17. It says, now the Lord is that spirit. Isn't that the beauty of the new covenant? See, you may not understand this, but the scripture teaches that when you give your heart to Jesus, this is how you really know you're saved, my friend. And it's very important that you understand this. It's so important that you understand this. It's not just because you pray a prayer. Because the Bible says you have to believe with your heart. You can believe with your head all day long. The Bible says the devils believe, but they also trust. So you can believe in your head all day long that a 33 and a half year old Jew died on two pieces of wood outside a city called Jerusalem. And you can even believe that he died on the cross for people's sins. And you can even believe he died for your sin. But if you haven't believed in your heart, then you are not saved. And when you believe in your heart, something very, very radical happens. Amen. The seed is planted and the spirit moves in. Yes. And when the spirit moves in, you'll never be the same. Yes. You can run right. in another direction. You can go to another continent. But you'll never be the same. Yes. He will chase you. Right. He will run after you. He will pursue you. Thank yes. you. <laughs> You can try and so I'm going to say that if I make my bed in hell, there you are. He's going to come for you. Yes. <laughs> and that's the love of God, my friend. He is going to come for you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And that, but when it happens, see, when you really do get saved, that's what happens. The Holy Spirit comes to live in you. Yes, yes. And, I, and, and, and liberty is, at, is right there because he's in you. And it's a matter of us yielding to it. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm telling you the truth. Can we believe it? And look what it says. But we all with open face, no veil, take the veil off. Beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Even as by the spirit of the Lord. What is it saying? When that seed of Christ is planted in you and the glory of the new covenant is planted in you through the Holy Spirit. It's almost like you can look at yourself in a glass, which they didn't have mirrors back then. But, but that's the, the word that's used by the King James is uh, reflecting metal. And you can see yourself change. It's like, wait, hold on a second. I'll look different. I look different than I did five years ago, ten years ago. See, and as we're yielding and the Holy Spirit is doing the work in us, He's changing us into the image of His Son. If we're dying, yes. Amen. see, Matt has to die. Amen. Matt has to die so that Christ can live in him. Yes, amen. Amen. It's been a hard road, my friend. Even as a person who loves God, it's hard work. Yes, it is. But it's worth it. Because in the end, there's an eternal kingdom. But it's not even just that. Even if he didn't give me the eternal kingdom, he's still worthy. Do you get that? I think it's important that we think about that. Because like, I'm not in this just for what he can give me. 
And if I am, then I'm really not dying like I'm supposed to be dying. I heard one preacher say, even if you put me in hell, Lord, you're still worthy. Yes. I was thinking about Moses the other day at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. They're about to go to the other side of the mountain. And the Lord's like, you can't go, Moses, because you hit the rock the second time. He was really only supposed to hit the rock. He didn't say all this, but I was saying, he was only supposed to hit the rock the first time because I told you I was going to stand on the rock. I might not have caught this. He said, I'm going to stand on that rock and I want you to strike that rock because, see, the Lord struck the rock, which is Christ, and struck him with a stick when he put him on the cross. But the second time, you're supposed to speak to the rock because see now the work of Christ is already yes, finished yes. Now you got to believe it and declare it in the name Amen. of Jesus. Amen. But now he struck the rock the second time. He said you can't go in but they about to go in. I just need you to do a couple of things for me. I need Joshua needs a little help. Okay. He's my man. I've chosen him and you're, gonna, you're about to die on this mountain over here and I'll bury you. Okay. But, 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 but I need you to go help Joshua out before I bring him into the promise. Right? I mean, can you imagine that? I don't know. When I read that, I was like, <laughs> he's like, that's right, son. That's exactly right. Amen. And if he chooses to do such a thing, that's right. Lord, yes. help us yes. to protect our heart that's right. <laughs> against bitterness. Yes. Right. Amen. Yes. People, people will hurt you, my friend. Yes. People in the church are going to hurt you. Amen. I wish it wasn't so. I wish we all woke up tomorrow and said, well, I'll tell you one thing. The truth of that message done killed me so much and all, the only thing that's coming out of me now is Jesus. Hallelujah. Wow. Wouldn't that be good if we just all woke up and were like, you know what? I prefer my brother over myself. <laughs> I choose today not to slander, not to have malice, not to have gossip. And instead, I will be like my Jesus. And I will love you. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Wouldn't that be good? Yes. Amen. They hurt me. But no, the Lord said, you've heard of the law to pray, right, for your head. But, but, but I don't even remember what all Jesus said. But look, I'm about to preach on that too. <laughs> to, 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 to keep my sayings, he said. Well, he said some stuff. Yeah. I didn't want you to walk one mile. I'm telling you to go two. He sues you for your coat. I want you to give him your tunic too. Wait, oh, what? Yes. Wait, what did you just say? I'm an American citizen. I got a right to sue people at the okay? You're an American citizen. Okay. Come on. I mean, you do what you want with it. I ain't got a reason to sue nobody right now. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be thinking hyperlink about it if I ever do have an opportunity to sue somebody. Because one of the questions that I have to ask myself, what kingdom am I living in? Amen. Yes, yes. And can the God of glory restore beyond what my mind was ever capable of thinking about? Okay. Amen. That's a whole other story. <laughs> All right. So we're being changed. Glory to glory. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.3. Though. I want you to see this. And we're still in the King James. He says, but this is what Paul said in the next chapter. He said this. But if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to them that are lost and whom the God of this world has blinded. Do you think that there's people that sit in churches? Because people will read that scripture and they'll say, yeah, but that's for the lost. But see, as a pastor, and I was trying to explain this to somebody recently. I was like, do you understand that I'm not just preaching to you? Like, in other words, I'm not just preaching to you. I'm not just preaching to John. I'm not just preaching to Jay. I'm preaching to him. I mean, it's not a huge church, but what I'm saying is, it's not a big church at all. But what I'm saying is, I'm preaching to multiple people. And I don't know all the secrets, like Sister prophesied. I don't know all your secrets. I know some of your secrets, but I don't know all your secrets. Right? Amen. Hey, I don't know where everybody stands with the Lord. Amen. Hey, you gotta have grace on the preacher. The preacher's gonna stand before the Lord and he's gonna give an account for what he said. Yeah. All right. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's people that are lost that are in church. Yeah. Yes. He said, in the, whom the, and, and, and if you're not lost and you're in the church, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I don't understand why you did it for such a wretch, wretch like me, but you sure enough did. And I will give, use my life to give you glory because you changed me and you transformed me. Yes. Yes. All right. But let it be known, church. The God of this world is trying to blind the minds of those people that don't believe and sit in the church. I'm telling you right now, he done ramped it up in the fifth year. And he's trying to blind the minds of people that are sitting in churches. Yes. Through false doctrine. Paul warned us. Yeah. He warned us it was coming and we acted like it wasn't a big deal. And I'm here to tell you it's here. In the latter days, some will depart from the faith. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
is here, my friend. Yes. He said this. He's trying to blind them with believe not because or because look, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He said, but boy, if that light would shine. Yes. <laughs> For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you know what? That's creation talk. Did you see that? He said the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our light. Yes. That's creation talk. He, he said, in, in the beginning, the Lord said, let there be light. And, and whenever the word of God goes forth, the truth of the gospel, the Holy Spirit, just like he hovered over the face of the deep, is hovering over your heart. And hallelujah, when you open it up, let that seed in there, let there be light. But the God of this world is trying to keep it from you. Yes. Y'all yeah. you, don't, you don't believe that. No, maybe you do. Somebody don't believe that on video. You don't believe that because and, and half of my Christian walk, I didn't believe it. What you talking about, preacher? Because if we believed what I just told you, we'd be protecting this treasure, my friend. Yes. Yeah. I don't know nothing about growing plants, but I'd be out there with, a, with one of them little metal things that you put around it trying to protect that thing. I'd be going there with an umbrella, put, giving it shade when it needs shade, and removing it when it needs water. I'd be yeah. nurturing that seedling. Yes. But the cares of the world? Yes, yes. Oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All right, I'm about to close, but look at this. Ephesians 4 and 17. Because look, <laughs> let me just say this. When you do receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, <coughs> praise God, when you mean business with God and you open up your heart and you let the seed of the gospel in there. I'm not the kind of preacher that does a whole lot of altar calls. You can call on Jesus right now. Now, I mean, I, I believe in altar calls. I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand me. Maybe it's a lack of faith on my part. Oh, you shouldn't say that, preacher. Well, then pray for me. Yeah. I give an altar call. It's like, it sounds like crickets in the house. Man, if you don't preach, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, I, but I will say this. I hope and pray that if you need to come to the altar, that you're not worried about well, nothing the preacher said, that you're not worried about your neighbor on the side of you, and that you'd be willing to do business with the Lord of glory. Yeah. But you can't do business on your bed, on the side of your bed, on your knees at night. Yeah. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that it's got to be real and it's got to be in your heart. It's got to be between you and God. Amen. Amen. And you let it in. Amen. And when you let it in, a miracle happens. And it says in the first Corinthians 6 and 17, your spirit becomes one with the Lord's yes. spirit. Hallelujah. And you're saved in your spirit. Yes. And in your spirit, you even have the mind of Christ. But you still got your own self in there that's fighting against it. And that's why the Apostle yeah. Paul said you got to be renewed in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how the God of this world is fighting against the new seedling that's in your heart. Yes. Yes. He's battling you in your own mind, your own will, and your own emotions. But I think what I think, preacher. I want what I want, preacher. I feel what I want to feel, preacher. And I'm fighting against and battling against the very will of God of him changing me. So what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that just because you're saved on the inside, if you think that God's going to leave you like that and you're going to walk around here acting like you're old man and God's okay with that. Oh, no, 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 he's not. And this, here's the word of God, Ephesians chapter four. Let's do that. The ESV version on this one, please. This is the apostle Paul. He's talking to Christians. He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do. You know what a Gentile is? Basically for now, for purposes now, it's a person that doesn't know God. Is it fair to say that? Yeah. Gentiles in the Old Testament were nations that weren't Israel. Israel knew God. Gentiles didn't know God. Now in the New Testament, Gentiles are people that don't know God. Okay? Yeah. This I say and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as worldlings. You should no longer walk as earthlings. 
that don't know God, right? In the futility of their minds, meaning that their minds are empty of the things of God. They are darkened in their understanding. They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. People outside of the will of God have hardened hearts, but unfortunately, well, and sometimes people in the church are like that too. We've all been there, have we not? Can we admit it? He says they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self. I kind of like the way the King James Version says it. Put off your old man. Yvette and musicians, y'all can start making your way for it. Please. You put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. So look, real quick, a synopsis. God was in the preparation of preparing a body for Jesus. In the fullness of time, he gave the world Jesus. Jesus accomplished the will of the Father and died on the cross. And now... You as a believer, if, if you are a believer, you have given your heart to Jesus, right? You've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've invited him in. And when you did, the Spirit of God moved into your heart. And now the, the Apostle Paul is talking to Christians. And he's saying, you're not a Gentile anymore. You hear me, church? You're not, you're not a, a worldling anymore. You're a new creation Amen. in Christ Jesus. And the plan of God is that you work with the Holy Spirit and allow him to change you. Amen. And, and, and he goes on to say this. He says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And look at this. And to put on the new self or the new man, which is created after the likeness of God yes. and true righteousness and holiness. Yes. The point that I want to make with that is that he's prepared a body for you. See, he prepared a body for Jesus. And now that you've got saved, he put Jesus in you. You believe that? You're in him. He's in you. The presence of Christ is in you if you're born again. And now he's desiring to produce the image of Christ yes. in you. He's, he, he's, a, he's like a surgeon with a, with a scalpel. And he's trying to remove those things. And the way that you work with the Holy Spirit in those things is that when he convicts you, y'all know what conviction is. I know some people do, some people don't. Conviction means when you do something wrong that's, that the Holy Spirit doesn't like, he makes you feel uncomfortable about Amen. it. Amen. And what is the right response is, I, I cry out to the Lord and I say, Lord, forgive me. Remove that from my life. Amen? And now he's removing things that are the old me and he's replacing new things and then the fruit of the Spirit starts to come out. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet.